Chapter Twenty Six of Wise and Otherwise. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wise and Otherwise by Pansy. Chapter Twenty Six. For vain man would be wise. On swift wings sped the late summer and early autumn. Before the busy people in Newton realized that the soft-winged autumn was fairly upon them, there came suddenly days of wind and rain and storm that sent the crimson and golden leaves in wild flutters through the air and left them in glowing heaps here and there along the ground. There was little time in which to gather and admire them. Frost followed rapidly in the wake of the autumn rains, and then one morning the busy town awoke, and lo, leaves, earth, grasses, all were gone, and the world was white. Baby Essie opened her blue eyes in wonderment over the miracle, and reached with eager hands for the white jewels as they fell and sparkled. The world was new to baby Essie, and everything that transpired was wonderful. By and by her eyes will grow accustomed to all these things, maybe, and the wonderful will sink into the commonplace. Maybe not. To some of God's children, the oft-repeated miracles of rain and snow and ice, and rainbow and cloud and storm, are always wonders. It may be it is reserved for baby Essie to have such rare eyes as these. Be that as it may, she stood a silent and amazed spectator at the transformation that the world had undergone while she slept, and presently broke the silence to announce, with much clapping of hands, that Auntie Julia was coming, and then pitifully that she was stepping on the white things and hurting them. An inch or more of snow thus early in the season, Mrs. Douglas said, stamping her feet and blowing the crystals from her muff. What sort of a winter does that promise? The miracle had grown very common to Mrs. Douglas. Baby Essie ran eagerly forward. She saw the white things fly. She wanted some. She searched right and left, under the table, behind the sofa. They were gone. What is the child in search of? Oh, Abby, as sure as the world, I believe she is looking for the snowflakes that I brought in. They are gone, darling, all gone, melted. Baby Essie looked at her informant gravely, wonderment deepening in her eyes. She understood gone, melted was yet a new process to learn. Presently she translated it in eager voice. Back to heaven, Auntie? Did they fly back to heaven? Mrs. Douglas laughed merrily. Oh, you darling little goosey, she said, catching her up and bestowing kisses on her cheeks, on her nose, on her chin, anywhere that they happened to fall. Abby, how will you ever teach her the ten million things that there are to be taught? Doesn't it make your heart ache for her? Ah, me, how rather shall we catch some of their sweet unworldly fancies that hover around them, and that it must be, the angels whisper to them, before the cares and griefs of life choke and scatter them? The mother of this baby only smiled quietly, without a shadow of heartache about her, and answered cheerily, One step at a time, did you never learn the little poem? One step and then another, and the longest walk is taken? What brought you out so early in the snow? Oh, said Mrs. Douglas, restored to the domain of the practical, I came to see Jerome. The doctor sent me. He hadn't time to come. Jerome hasn't gone yet, has he? Ah, Abby, you don't know who is coming here. Jerome will be down in a few minutes. What news have you? Did you ever hear of Mr. Parker? Mr. Parker, said Mrs. Sales thoughtfully. Why, yes, I've known several persons of that name. Oh, Julia, do you mean an old minister, Esther's Mr. Parker? This last with a very bright face. Yes, Esther's Mr. Parker, and the doctor's, and mine for that matter. I have a very deep personal interest in him, although I was but a child at the time. He is a blessed old saint, one of God's peculiar people without doubt. Well, don't you think he is coming here to the Park Street Church to conduct a meeting? Now isn't that blessed? Jerome! As Mr. Sales at that moment entered the room, the doctor sent me to tell you about him, and ask if you didn't think the two churches might be united. He says Dr. Willis told him last evening that Mr. Tresevant was to be invited to join them, and the doctor said if Mr. Tresevant felt that his church was very anxious to do so, it would perhaps influence him in that direction if he needed influencing. And he wanted to know if you would have time to call on Judge Benson this morning and consult with him. If you would kindly inform me which of the pronouns belong to which persons, and what two churches especially need uniting, and what Mr. Tresevant is to be invited to join, perhaps I might feel more enlightened. 
and Mr. Sayles leaned against the window sash and looked down on his informant with an amused air. Mrs. Douglas laughed good-humoredly. "'Oh, dear,' she said, "'I always put a story the wrong end first. Now I'll begin at the beginning.' Mr. Sayles listened, interested, eager, all his listlessness gone. The Regent Street Church, the church of his heart, the only one with which he had ever been connected, was at a very low ebb so far as its practical piety was concerned. The prayer meetings, those unerring barometers of a church, were very thinly attended and the mass of Christians, when they met together, were apt, the gentlemen to discuss the business excitements of the day, and the ladies to lay plans for the gay season, instead of having aught to say concerning the journey they had pledged their vows to take together, helping each other on the way. Yet there were an eager few whose hearts were longing and groping for something better, enough to claim the promise, where two or three, etc. They had been praying earnestly, longingly, during the past weeks, and this intimation of the rousing of a sister church seemed to Mr. Sayles like an answer to prayer. "'Of course we must unite,' he said decidedly. "'Our hopes and desires are the same. Why should we not unitedly seek their fulfillment? I don't know this Mr. Parker personally, but if ever I had a desire to see a man in my life, it is he. I have heard very much of the blessing that attends his labors.' "'But Jerome,' said Mrs. Douglas, anxiously, do you think Mr. Tresevant will be in sympathy with this idea? Mr. Sayles smiled meaningly. What makes you think he will not be? I don't know, I am sure, Mrs. Douglas said, flushing and laughing. Only I, he, well, the truth is, he never happens to be in sympathy with anything, and I suppose I took it for granted that he wouldn't be with this. I know you would hardly make that remark outside of this room, Mr. Sayles answered her gravely but charity is one thing, and plain common-sense knowledge is another. I don't suppose there is any real good to be gained in shutting our eyes to the fact that our pastor does not seem to view these things in the light that we wish he did. I confess I doubt his willingness to join in these meetings, and if he does so, I think it will be because of the pressure of his church. Abby, that isn't wicked, is it, between ourselves, you know? Mrs. Sayles was engaged in putting on baby Essie's shoe, a process that had to be gone through with an indefinite number of times, but she looked up with serene brow and spoke gently. Don't you think, Jerome, there are shortcomings enough in people that are positively known to us, without our condemning those that may be? Besides, I don't like to injure the spirituality of just ourselves by going over, any more than is necessary, what is a trial and a disappointment to us. You see, said Mr. Sayles, turning to their guest, with a half-serious, half-comic air, when I make extra efforts to rise superior to your standpoint, I don't succeed in coming within reach of hers. I may as well drop back at once to your platform. Then gravely, Abby is right. The least said the better, for us at least. Well, I will see Judge Benson and Mr. Saunders, and what others I can." The end of it was that the officers of the church went in a body to call on Mr. Tresevant, Dr. Douglas as one of the officers, making one of the number. Ice could not have been harder to impress than was their dignified pastor. In the first place these gentlemen, like most others when they undertake to move in an official capacity, had not moved rapidly enough. Dr. Willis, the acting pastor of the Park Street Church, had been there before them, and given his cordial, hearty invitation to the pastor of the Regent Street Church, for pastor and people to unite with them in a series of meetings. This invitation Mr. Tresevant had seen fit to decline. There was no special interest in this church, he said, and he was not a believer in forced revivals. Does any one imagine that after such a statement, Mr. Tresevant had any idea of changing his mind, merely because the officers of the church desired it, and thus showing plainly to Dr. Willis that he was not the controlling power in his own church. This Mr. Parker, he said stiffly, in response to Dr. Douglas's earnest words concerning him, is a man of whom I never heard before, and I certainly cannot be expected to invite my people to attend the meetings of a man concerning whom I know nothing. Save that which Dr. Douglas has just been telling us, said Judge Benson pointedly, with a courteous bow to the doctor. This sentence Mr. Tresevant chose to ignore. Dr. Douglas spoke again, and very earnestly. Mr. Tresevant, concerning this evangelist, you have only to go ten miles west of here on the railroad to the town where I used to live, 
to receive repeated and undoubted proof of what I have been telling you. It was there that the powerful work of grace followed his labors. Besides, Dr. Willis tells me that he himself is an intimate personal friend of Mr. Parker, and that they have worked together for years. This from Judge Benson. Mr. Tresevant bowed. Then Dr. Willis doubtless does quite right in inviting him to his church, but I have no such acquaintance with him, and in general, gentlemen, I cannot say that I approve of evangelistic labor. He must be a very poor pastor indeed who cannot guide and care for his own flock better than any stranger coming into their midst. Old Mr. Osborne, whose hair was white with the snows of more than seventy winters, and who rarely spoke much, yet had the reputation of speaking to the point, now joined the debate. But there's two sides to that question, isn't there? An evangelist generally brings to the work years of experience with all classes of minds, and he has no sermons to write nor studying to do during special meetings, and can give his whole time to the work. It seems to me those are reasons that a young minister will appreciate, and if an evangelist be a judicious man, I don't see why he couldn't be of the greatest help to a pastor. They are not by any means remarkable for judiciousness, sir, and, speaking for myself, I have found myself thus far entirely able to fulfill my pulpit and pastoral duties without outside aid. Mr. Tresevant's tone was rather more haughty than courtesy would justify, coming from so young a man to so aged a Christian, but Mr. Osborne did not seem inclined to be awed by it. Well, he said, speaking in low measured tones, as to their being judicious as a class, I can't say, of course, for I don't know many of them. But I have been intimately acquainted with Brother Parker for fifty-odd years, and he has managed to be remarkably judicious in his work during that time, and that is a good many years longer than you've lived yet, Mr. Tresevant. Dr. Douglas and Judge Benson both turned to Mr. Osborne with eager interest in their manner, Dr. Douglas speaking first. Do you know our Brother Parker? Ay, that I do, and blessed reason have I to rejoice over it. It's thirty years now since he was the means of leading me to my Saviour, though I knew him long before that. In fact, we were lads together. That was a wonderful meeting that I attended thirty years ago. Many of the things he said in those sermons are just as vivid to me now as our talk is here this evening. The fact is, gentlemen, said Mr. Tresevant, breaking abruptly into the old man's beloved past, we don't agree in these matters, and we probably shouldn't if we talked all night. The old gentleman who seems to have stolen your hearts may be perfection, for aught I know. I do not say that he isn't. But I insist that I know better what kind of food my people need than he, an entire stranger, can know. Besides, I do not approve of religious excitement. This sudden multiplication of meetings, without any cause, therefore, looks to me wonderfully like a device of man's, with which the spirit has very little to do. Therefore I cannot consent to join in such a plan. What kind of excitement do you believe in? queried Mr. Osborne. Sir, answered his pastor haughtily. I thought, said the old man meekly, I would like to know what it was proper to get excited about. Whereupon Dr. Douglas and Judge Benson were guilty of exchanging glances and smiles. Then Judge Benson took up the subject. But is that quite fair, Mr. Tresevant? Is it quite as we act in other matters of much less importance? Suppose a man never evinces any special interest in his own salvation, shall we, as Christians, evince none? During a political campaign we are very apt, you know, to multiply meetings, for no apparent cause save that we are anxious to have people on the right side. Shall we, as our brother Osborne suggests, be less interested in the important question of urging the people to take the right side in this issue, which is for eternity? I confess I see no inconsistency in using whatever proper means the Lord sends within our reach, to the end that we may persuade some one to take the right stand. There are several ways of working for the same end, the pastor said, trying to smile, and this is not my way of working, therefore I must still persist in my previous conviction. End of chapter 26. Recording by Tricia G.